glad to have you all here. Uh, tonight we're going to take a look at this concept of fake news and wanted to approach it in a way that wasn't too terribly controversial. The way fake news is handled now, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a flashpoint sort of topic. Uh, so we're going to kind of step back a few years and look at a case study of something that happened a few decades back, uh, which will give us a chance to kind of analyze how fake news happens, the different forms that it comes in, and how to recognize uh, fake news and figure out what's real and what may not be. Now, for fake news to uh, be able to really take root and be believable, it has to fit the context of its time. And so the first thing we have to look at before we get into this is uh, what was life like in 1938. So just very quickly, um, we're in an industrial revolution throughout the 1800s and moving on into the early 1900s. And really, we're still in this ever-evolving uh, age of new inventions. And a couple of the important ones, um, just mentioned a couple, uh, airplanes, Automobiles are making it possible to travel vast distances, unimaginable, uh, just a few decades before in record times. And of course, as part of this broadcast, the concept of someone's going to come from Mars and attack Earth, that has to be believable. The world was a tough place in 1938. People were used to bad news. Uh, we had had the Great Depression. We were still having the Great Depression. People were used to hard times. To turn on the radio and hear something bad was not a shock to anyone. And then we're in the age leading up to World War II. <coughs> Most adults at that time remembered World War I well. They remembered the horrors of that war. And now hearing uh, rumors of uh, Japanese aggression in the Pacific and the rise of dictators in Europe was bringing Americans to the point where they were worried they were going to be drugged into another one of these great wars. And so there's this great tension. Uh, and most especially the Munich negotiations where Adolf Hitler had demanded the Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia, and England, France, and Italy had met with him. And they had just, in September, worked out a compromise which was going to allow the Nazis to uh, take the Sudetenland. And the world had been very tense during these negotiations. And it, it's starting to breathe a little sigh of relief, thinking this has achieved peace in our time. But of course, you know the story. It has not. Within a few months, the Nazis would invade all of Czechoslovakia, and soon World War II would break out in the following year. So the world is on the brink of war. Now, in uh, science and science fiction, their mind has to be just right to believe this report of Martians attacking it. <coughs> There was, in the late 1800s, there had been a lot of discoveries with astronomy, and one particular report uh, by uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, uh, an Italian, he had reported using a telescope, and he had analyzed the surface of Mars, and seeing these lines across the surface, he had identified what he thought were continents and bodies of water, and he referred to what he thought were the rivers as canali in Italian. But when it was translated into English, they used the word canals, and instead of it sounding like a natural river, it sounded more like a uh, something that was made by intelligent life forms. And so the rumors start spreading that they found evidence of life on Mars. And another uh, astronomer did some research and you know, started naming all these and was saying this was proof that there was indeed life on Mars. Now, it wasn't very long before other astronomers had completely discredited this idea, but but that idea was out there. People had heard it. The idea that Mars you know, is a potential place for life, that was in the back of people's heads. Uh, early science fiction, uh, Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, these men had given us uh, stories like Princess of Mars, uh, The Time Machine, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and of course H.G. Wells' War of the World. So we did have early science fiction literature that had developed out of this uh, age of inventions and industry, but you also, by the 1930s, had a new form of uh, cult fiction that was really starting to catch on. It would really be in more of the 1950s before sci-fi was really starting to uh, hit its stride, but it was really beginning. You had uh, <coughs> magazines like Amazing Stories and Sounding Stories of Super Science that were publishing these uh, stories that make 
Invasion from Mars sound a little more believable. And then even in the movies, you have Flash Gordon, the serial had come out. And, um, so people have these images in their head already about what potential invasions might look like from another planet. And of course we have new media, which is changing the way people gain information in the early 1930s. We had had for more than a decade now, we had had motion pictures. People were used to going to the theaters and seeing newsreels, seeing the news from around the world. But now there was a new invention. Now radio had brought entertainment and news right into our living room. And people were in the habit of rather regularly gathering around the radio, the way my generation gathered around the TV, uh, the way your generation, I guess, gathers around somebody's iPhone uh, when the teacher's not looking during class to watch a video <laughs> film. Uh, but this was new form of entertainment and information. And people weren't totally sure what was real and what was fake. So to begin, we need to listen to a little bit of this War of the Worlds broadcast. The Mercury <coughs> Theater, just before Halloween in 1938, uh, the director is Orson Welles, uh, is going to present War of the Worlds. And the way they do it, rather than just presenting it as a straightforward radio play, they decide to do this broadcast as <coughs> news flashes and news clips. And as you listen to this first segment, you'll hear uh, once they get into the play that you'll hear uh, broadcasts of music to listen to and then they'll break in with the news flash and this will kind of give you an idea we'll listen to probably the first 10 minutes this is the one kind of lengthy clip I want to listen to but it really gives you a feel for what we're talking about here. so let's give this a listen <coughs> Now with these old radios, they actually have to warm up before you get anything out of them. And then you have to actually dial to find something. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by A. G. Wells. <laughs> gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Intellects, vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. Near the end of October, business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crosley service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radio. Not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We take you now to the Merlin Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. <laughs> We interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, <coughs> Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas <coughs> occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. 
The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquelos playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York. <laughs> Popular Stardust, Raymond Raquello and his artist. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with another astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on this event. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. The ticking sound you hear is the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through the giant lens. Professor, may I begin our question? <laughs> Uh, any time, Mr. Cook. Professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Cook. <coughs> a red disk swimming in a blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disk. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, Mr. Huh. Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Cook. Although that's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to the planet. Then you're quite convinced, as a scientist, that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars? <clears throat> Say the chances against it are a thousand to one. And yet, how do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? First, I cannot account for it. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past ten minutes, we've been speaking to you from the Observatory of Princeton bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. We take you now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles in Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin. Thank you for a word picture of a strange scene before my eyes, like something out of a modern Arabian night. Uh, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. I guess that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. Half buried in a fast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree. It must have struck on its way down. But I can see the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of... Um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, uh, what's the diameter of the... About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheet is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish-white. It's curious. Spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. They're uh, getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, uh, would you mind standing this side, please? While the are uh, pushing the crowd back. Here's Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmot. Uh, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that stopped in your backyard? Uh, uh, step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilson. Well, I was listening to the radio. Closer and louder, please. Pardon? Uh, louder, please, closer. Yes. <clears throat> I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsy. A professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half chosen. Half yes, yes, Mr. Wilson, and uh, then what happened? Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio 
kind of halfway. Yes, Mr. Wilworth. And then you saw something. Well, not first off. I heard something. And what did you hear? A uh, hissing sound like this. Uh, kind of like a 4th of July rocket. Yes, then what? I turned my head out the window and would have sworn I was asleep and dreaming. Yes. I seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Willis? Well, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I was kind of riled. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilmot. Thank you very much. Yes, you want me to no, that's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm, where this thing has... Now, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. Here. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson? Yes, Mr. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? What the thing? The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. Friction with the earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and... You can see it's cylindrical shape. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw and this thing must be hollow. He's moving! He's back! 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 Might be almost oh, 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 heaven. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one, and another one, and another one. They look like tentacles to me. I can see the thing's body now. It's large. It's large as a bear. This one's like wet leather, but that's face. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. Its eyes are black and they gleam like a surf in the mouth. It's a kind of V-shape with saliva dripping from its windless lips. It seems to. Oh, it's quiver and pulsate and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now and the cloud falls back and seems plenty to put this kind of experience for you, I can't find words. And, well, I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description so I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my honor. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that joins Mr. Wilmer's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole thing. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. There's more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the cars back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain is conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted and the professor moves around one side studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. Those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait a minute, something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against the mirror. The set. There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it looks right at the advancing men. Strikes him head on. Oh, look, they're turning into flames. Ah! I see a car by the woods that flies it. The gas tank, tanks with the automobiles spreading <coughs> everywhere. Coming this way now. About 20 yards to my right. And then it goes dead. They're starting to rain the cannon. The rain had the. Uh... Now, people listening to this broadcast, if they missed the introduction and just tuned in during the music, which some people may have done. They'd immediately start hearing music, then they'd hear the uh, news flashes. And if they followed this, it could sound very believable. And there weren't many station breaks in this radio broadcast. The way the Mercury Theater generally ran, you heard the introduction, 
you know it's a play. There's not a station break ex until they get halfway through the hour-long broadcast. And at that point, then they make one station break, and then you won't hear it to play again until the end. And the problem was they had even moved the station break further back to about 40 minutes in to uh, fit the script. So there were some people that may have listened to this <laughs> and not known for quite some time that this is a play. Now, there's the other added issue uh, that sounds very much, the way it's done, like a very recent disaster. The Hindenburg the rain again, the rain broadcast had, uh, up a is very bit. recent. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It must have a plane. Get this started, get this started. It's flying at its flashing. It's flashing terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's running virtually in the plane. Oh, my. It's falling on the Boeing 7. All the folks are doing this. This is terrible. This is the work of the work. Now, that Hindenburg broadcast was fresh in <clears throat> people's minds. It was even one of the most sensational broadcasts uh, that people had heard in live news radio. And the actor who was doing the reporting for the Grover's Mill destruction there had listened to that broadcast all afternoon to get himself ready to do this piece. So it very much sounded like a real broadcast. Now, also there's the fact that people were ready to hear news of an attack. People were in the mindset of a possible war. And there's some stories that maybe some people heard the broadcasts and thought, Nazis, Nazis are invading. And as the Martians marched across New Jersey and New York and took over towns, people listening to it may have even heard the word Martian, but in their mind it's Nazi. In their mind it's the Germans. This is a real war. This is for real. And that may have been the case for some. And of course, if you look at the way a uh, Martian machine destroying the landscape versus uh, a German tank rolling across the landscape, the descriptions would have sounded very similar. But there's another thing as well. It, if it sounds like it's real, how do you tell the difference? And in our modern media, we still have the same issue. Radios back then might have been confusing for people. Is it real? Is it fake? Today, if it's online, is this real? Is this fake? If you look at this particular Bernie Sanders uh, web page, is this for real? Is it fake news? Is, has someone else created this? Uh, during the election, when Hillary Clinton is running against Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders supporters, if they don't support Hillary, uh, might, it might cost her the election, could cost her some votes. And so a, a website like this, is this really for somebody that's truly a Bernie Sanders supporter? Is this from a Republican who's created it to convince Democrats not to vote? Is it from outside the United States? Anyone want to guess which one this is? This one, I believe, is from Albania. Some of the folks that were farmed out to do some of the fake uh, news creations. So. You look at the site, you can't tell. Is this the real thing? Is it not? Now, if you go through the site and look at it a little closer, maybe you can tell, but sometimes it's very hard to tell if it's real or not. And then there's one more phenomenon with the idea of hearing what you expect to hear. This phenomenon online with building an echo chamber. <coughs> if you're on Facebook or Twitter or some other type of social media, and you've befriended a certain group of people with similar views to your own, probably. They're the people you like. They're the people that you hang out with. They're the people that you befriend online. And then as they post things online, it's stuff that makes sense to you. It sounds believable because it fits your group's ideology. And so if somebody posts something that's fake news, well, it's from one of your friends that you trust or one of the people that has a similar idea. And so you take it and you run with it because this is something believable. And maybe you're not as analytical as you should be questioning whether this is real or not. And this is one of the problems we have in uh, modern media is having these expectations. People expected trouble in 1938 and they got it on the radio and it sounded believable to them. Now, in this broadcast, some of this is unintentionally fooling people. But some of this may have been very intentional. I'm going to play just another short little clip of one of the things in the broadcast that was very much designed to blur the uh, 
<coughs> lines between reality and fantasy. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle which took place tonight at Grover Mills has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by an army in modern times. The monster is now in control of the middle section of New Jersey and has effectively cut the state through its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Martial law prevails throughout New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. At this time, we take you to Washington for a special broadcast on the national emergency. The Secretary of the Interior. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you, private citizens and public officials, all of you, the urgent need of calm and resourceful action. Placing our faith in God, we must continue the performance of our duties, each and every one of us, so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous, and consecrated to the preservation of human supremacy on this earth. I thank you. You have just heard the Secretary of the Interior speaking from Washington. Bulletin. Now, the Secretary of the Interior speaking from Washington. For folks back then, if I were to play you Donald Trump speaking today, and I told you, this is the Secretary of the Interior, and then you heard Donald Trump speaking. His voice is distinctive. His manner of delivery is distinctive. You hear that voice, you'd know who we were talking about, even if I tell you it's someone different. In this case, they say it's the Secretary of the Interior, but the actor playing the Secretary of the Interior is very much mimicking our president, and people were used to hearing our president at that time. Our president regularly gave fireside chats, one of the first presidents to really use modern media well. And here's just a little clip from one of his fireside chats. I am speaking to you from my Delphine Executive Mansion in Albany on a subject that is not in the narrow or comfortable way political. It's a little hard to hear, but you kind of get the idea. This sounds like the president. For somebody not paying very close attention, then they hear the president's voice. That guy they're used to tuning in and listening to, they tune in and he's telling them, you know, to prepare to defend the country against this invasion. So it made it sound very believable. Now, the entertainment industry <coughs> oftentimes... Uh, uses very realistic sounding things for different purposes. One, just sometimes it piques interest. It can sell tickets. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the publicity uh, that was generated from this, there's a saying that there's no such thing as bad publicity. For Orson Welles, some people praised him for a brilliant radio production. Some people condemned him for being irresponsible and scaring people. But either way, it got people's attention and ultimately resulted in a quarter million dollar contract with RKO Pictures, which would go on to uh, lead to him producing Citizen Kane, one of the classic Hollywood movies. But he was able to use the attention because it sounded real. It got people's attention. Besides uh, selling tickets, um, you know, that's sometimes what gets people to tune in to movies or to television shows. Uh, you know, I don't remember how long ago it was. It's been a while. It seems a very short time ago to me. But uh, when the Blair Witch Project film came out, <laughs> most of y'all are probably familiar with that. That was one of the first films where they used very shaky camera work and portrayed it and even advertised <coughs> it as if it was found footage of these teenagers getting lost in the woods and being gotten by the witch. Well. That believability spread its popularity. And you see that kind of thing still, where the media will do this. Even 
you know, one of, as a history teacher, the History Channel. If you've watched the History Channel, sometimes there's not a lot of history in what history you get on there. Sometimes you question, is it, is it entertainment or is this history? And some of the things I see on there, uh, these stories about how space aliens, you know, brought us all here and created the world because, you know, ancient alien theory. Or uh, the search for Bigfoot. And to have these kind of fantasy sort of shows is one thing, but there's a few of these shows that they portray like the search for Bigfoot as if it was found footage. And they dramatize these incidents where people have encountered Bigfoot and these actors are acting like they're, they're really being chased by Bigfoot. There's the footage of it. And, and if you're not paying close attention, it looks like, oh, they've proved Bigfoot. Here he is on film attacking these people. And no, it's not. It, but it's the History Channel. It's got to be history. It, it can sometimes be confusing. And then, of course, in Hollywood, um, historical uh, fiction movies. That's one thing. I mean, people go watch movies. Sometimes my students get a little confused about what's real and what's true. Well, that was in the movie. No, that was a, a movie. It was fictional. Yes, it's set in historical time. It's not real. But then there's the, um, the type of things that actually have a political agenda that Hollywood puts out. Now, if you remember a few years back, An Inconvenient Truth uh, with Al Gore. Now, that obviously had a political agenda. But at least, when you, if you went and saw it or rented it or whatever, you watched An Inconvenient Truth, you knew going in, this is a political argument. That's great. Now, you may or may not agree with his facts and all of that. That in itself might be where you need to check for is this accurate or not. But you know it's a political argument. That's not going to fool you. But sometimes just plain entertainment <laughs> is pushing a political agenda. And it's easy to miss because it just seems like this is an adventure. This is a love story. Uh, I tried to pick a couple of very benign sort of obvious ones um, rather than getting some more controversial ones. But if you remember the movie uh, The Day After Tomorrow, it's been a while back. But this was very obviously, it's an adventure where people are trying to survive uh, you know, all these natural disasters. But the agenda of the movie is kind of pushing the idea of uh, global warming, climate change, and you know, pushing this particular idea. And going further back, uh, John Wayne making the movie The Green Berets in the early 1960s. This was a, a very pro-war, pro-American movie during a time uh, where we were facing off communism. And uh, John Wayne was intending to try to uh, push that idea that, you know, America's right and we're in this struggle with communism. So, um, now these are pretty obvious and pretty easy ones. There's other movies that you're probably familiar with that push certain social agendas or ideas. And it's, it's just kind of mixed in there. It's good to have stuff to think about, but you want to be sure when you're watching it, you notice that that's what you're watching, that you're getting some kind of a message. Now, in the War of the Worlds, perhaps Orson Welles was trying to get a message across. And we're going to listen to the last two minutes of the broadcast, which will give us his final statement. And this might give us a clue what message he might have been trying to deliver. This picks up with the well, scientist the going into New York and the seeing the end of the end of that silent show. Anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. Reached 14th Street and there again by black powder, several bodies, and an evil, ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars that come to house the house. Wandered up through the 30s and 40s. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. <coughs> Same idea. I, I, I rushed recklessly across Colombo Circle and into the park. I, I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street. From there, I could see standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground. And there before my eyes, dark and silent, lay the Martians with the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh. 
Later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Playing, after all, man's defense has failed. But the humblest thing is God that wisdom is put upon the earth. <laughs> it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. <laughs> Starting now, we couldn't soak all your windows and steal all your garden gates. By tomorrow night, so we did the best the next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the CBS. We'll be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. <laughs> itself, as we remember it historically, caused mass panic. People across the country tuned into parts of the radio program. They were confused about what they were hearing. They believed it was real. And so there are stories of people uh, rushing out, hopping in their car, and driving off into the woods to escape the Martians. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's stories about the people in the actual little town of Grover's Mill, where it had been said, <coughs> Uh, grabbing their guns and roaming the streets, uh, looking for the aliens to shoot the aliens. Uh, there was a particular town uh, up in uh, Washington State, in it was a Skagit County, uh, Washington, that had the unfortunate event of during this broadcast, the power went out. <laughs> and to them, that confirmed this is an alien attack. They just took the power out. Run for the hills. And there's these awful stories of people. Uh, getting ready to commit suicide and committing suicide, <coughs> dying of heart attacks because of this broadcast. Now, that's the story we remember. That's the story that is told again and again. And there's some element of truth to that, but whereas the broadcast itself may be fake news, in a way, this story also is, to a certain degree, fake news. The newspapers, had an opportunity here. They had competition. This little machine is taking away some of their business. And now, this little machine had just caused panic. And the bigger the panic, the less reliable this little machine will be. And so, newspapers really played up all these awful reports. And of course, and also it's to sell copy, because for the newspapers, if it's a sensational story, people will want to buy your newspaper as well. So they play this up and, and the stories just go on and on and there's all these stories and of course if you ask somebody well what happened to you well a lot of people just want to you know get their name in the paper so they tell this story and and there's a good bit of evidence the newspapers actually played this up now adding uh, fuel to the fire a professor I believe it was at Princeton about a year and a half after the broadcast did some research and he decided according to his research, that about six million Americans listened to the broadcast, and of that six million, about one million were convinced it was real. And this was a professor who had done scientific research to figure this out. And so that story had now more validity. But later historians have started kind of picking this apart. Uh, Jefferson Poley and Michael Soklo, uh, two journalism professors back in 2013, they re-examined this. And there have been others that have re-examined it as well. And they got to looking at it. They first of all found a lot of fault with uh, Cantrell's methodology. They figured this is probably a million more people than could have possibly even been listening to the radio show at that time. Much less, how do you verify this? And they looked at his methodology and found this isn't quite 
accurate. They looked at, and of course we have the Nielsen ratings today to tell us who's watching what. Well back then it was the Hooper Report, which uh, they would call around during radio shows and ask random people what you were listening to. And according to the Hooper Report for that night, only 2% of their audience was listening to any kind of a radio play at all, much less whether these people were fooled into believing it was real. There's no evidence for that. So there's a real lack of evidence that there was this widespread panic. Plus, they found plenty of anecdotal stories about the policemen who were sent to the CBS to tell um, Orson Welles, you've got to make an announcement and tell people this is fake. Reporting that no, no one was on the streets. It was deserted. It was late. Nobody's out. There, wasn't, there weren't people running around in a mad panic. So there's a lot of anecdotal stories. That probably wasn't a lot of real panic. And then they started researching the truth behind the story of them uh, the people in Grover's Mill finding the water tower, which looked like one of those Martian <coughs> tripod machines, <coughs> shooting it full of holes. And they traced the origin of this story finally back to a 1938 news report with a photograph. I should have put the photograph on here. I'm sorry I didn't do that. Uh, of one old fella by the name of William Dock, 76 years old, that lived in Grover's Mill. And when the newspapers came poking around looking for a story, this old guy picked up his shotgun and said, yeah, I heard the report. And I took my shotgun out, looked around, see if there's any Martians. They said, did you shoot anything? No, I didn't see anything that needed shooting. And they took his picture for the paper. <laughs> and that's the only documented evidence of anyone actually being out there. The water tower in Grover's Mill, it's fine. There's a, it's still there. It's an old rusting water tower that's mostly grown up with weeds. There's no evidence of it being shot up any more than probably every water tower in America has got some kind of graffiti or being shot at by somebody. But it wasn't shot to pieces by the people. And probably as the story developed, people started talking about one guy said he shot, uh, looked around to shoot something, and then he shot something, then a bunch of people were doing it, then they shot the water tower full of holes, and it just kind of evolved like that. So there's a good chance that a lot of what we remember is also fake news. Now, fake news is not at all new. Dealing with the media today, figuring out what's fake, what's real, it can be difficult. Because first of all, even before you get to intentionally fake news, there's simply bias. And all of us are biased, because bias is simply your point of view. Even if you have video evidence of an event, it's bias. If you don't believe me, spend the afternoon watching NFL football and the instant replay and they don't know what happened in this play and they watch five different camera angles and after they get through watching five different camera angles showing what happened the referee comes out and says the play stands is called because there's not enough evidence to figure out what actually happened and that's video everything's bias it's a point of view now of course some bias is more intentional than others and more heinous than others of course we have all kinds of different news media print media, radio media, televised media. And I tell my students, you know, if you really want to know what's going on, don't pick the one channel, leave it on 24-7. I know plenty of people that do. Uh, that's just their only news from that one station. If you really want to know what's going on, wa watch several of them. In fact, a very interesting thing to do, let something big and controversial happen. And I challenge you to do this next time something big and controversial hits the paper. Get online, on TV, and go between channels or go between newspaper headlines. And they'll tell the same facts. They're not lying. They're giving accurate facts. But it's that spin, the way they present those facts, that one station says, Donald Trump vows to build a wall to keep America safe. Flip it over to another station. Donald Trump vows to build a wall. The dreamers are in panic. And you take a look at the particulars, both stories are accurate, both stories have factual information, but it's the spin they put on it gives you a very different point of view. And then you put it in the newspaper and surround it by other articles about illegal aliens committing acts, uh, uh, criminal acts, or surrounded by stories about dreamers being separated from their families. You can build on the page of that paper an argument without ever telling a lie, without ever saying anything that's false, but it's that spin which can uh, give you a, a sense of fake news. And of course, then there's act, actually direct fake news that's just outright lies that's in print. And it's not anything new. This is one of my favorite Bible verses as a history professor. 
There's no new thing under the sun. It's all been done before. You see something bad happen in the world, don't get too panicked. We've probably gone through it before. In the case of fake news, I just picked out three examples. We'll go all the way back to 1274 BC for the first example. A fellow by the name of Ramses II is king of Egypt, and he is invading Mesopotamia. He is fighting with the Hittites. And he didn't do well. He got up there, got some bad intelligence, got himself separated from the main army, nearly got wiped out by several thousand Hittite chariots. He was barely saved by his army in the nick of time. He had to give up his plans of conquest. Instead, he made a peace agreement with the Hittites and withdrew from the area. But when he got back to Egypt, before stories started spreading about what really happened, he had his official poets write this great poem about how he had single-handedly held off the Hittite army and won a great victory. And the official records of Egypt portray this as a great victory. And there's actually records of communications between Ramses and the Hittite king. And the Hittite king sends him, basically in you know, an old form of writing, he sends him this letter and says, hey, why are you bragging about this victory that you didn't win? And he says, hey, the gods didn't smile on me in this moment. They betrayed me. But he doesn't really apologize for lying to his people. And that's part of it. If you're a politician, if you're a media figure, and you tell a lie strong enough, confidently enough, and loud enough, you're going to win over the belief of a lot of people. And when somebody brings along the truth, yours is already established as the truth. And they're going to have a hard time convincing people otherwise. So that's one example. Another example? Good old Ben Franklin, 1782, the American Revolution is drawing to a close. We've already won at Yorktown. Negotiations are going on to end the war. <coughs> ben Franklin's a little concerned that we might be too conciliatory with Britain. We might not get a good deal. We need to make sure that we really push Britain hard and maybe undermine the British government's ability to negotiate a good peace by undermining the popularity of the British government. So, he created a fake newspaper. It was a real newspaper, the Boston Chronicle, but over in France, where he was acting as ambassador, he got a press, he created this flyer that looked like an addition to the Boston Chronicle, and it told about how the British government, the British king, had sent weapons and money to the Native Americans to massacre men, women, and children on the frontier and how they had these bags of scalps that they were bringing to the British government, and how they even had a note in one of them that said, give these to the king to make him happy. And that's sure, there were massacres on the frontier. That, that much is true, but the story was played up. And he made sure it was distributed to the right people to convince people that the British government had been involved. So he was very clearly pushing a political agenda. This kind of falls under also propaganda during the time of war. And then there's this one. I love this one. This one, by the way, for former Texas history students, this story is circulating during the Texas Revolution. In 1835, the New York Sun, they have having slow, slow news days, so they needed some news to get subscription rates up. So they published a story that a very famous um, astronomer, a very real guy, uh, his name was... Oh, I don't have his name. But he was one of the most famous astronomers in the world at the time. They used a real person's name, and he had discovered life on the moon. There were two-legged beavers, unicorns, and, of course, the favorite, the furry humanoid creatures with bat wings that are flying around up there. And they ran six issues of the paper before they finally admitted this was a hoax. And that was pretty much just to sell papers, but the thing is about both Ben Franklin's story and this story, printed in fake papers, these stories were picked up by other legitimate papers <coughs> in America and in Europe and were run as legitimate news. And uh, the particular art, um, <coughs> astronomer who they attributed to in this story, originally he didn't care that he, they used his name in a fake story, that was kind of funny, until every time he gave a lecture, that's all people wanted to know about is his discoveries on the moon. And that was pretty much the rest of his life. He had to deal with this fake story. <coughs> and it's sometimes hard to tell what is the fake story. 
when I read the newspaper online, there's all these stories, all these things to click on. But sometimes at the bottom of the page or along the side of the page, or even worse, mixed in with the real news are these paid advertisements. And are they real? Are they fake? It's hard to tell, sometimes looking at the media, what is real, what is fake. So, what is our responsibility as American citizens in identifying what is real and what's fake? As I was looking at the different stories about what people experienced on the night of the War of the Worlds broadcast, there's one particular story that really kind of sums up what our responsibility is. One fellow, he was an old man in the 1970s when he was interviewed, but he had been a young man at the time of the broadcast. He was 11 years old. And he had turned on the radio, and he had heard the Martians were attacking. And Daddy was at work, so he called his dad. And he told his dad, Dad, the Martians are attacking. His dad said, put the phone near the radio. His dad listened for a few seconds. He says, all right, just a minute, hold on. His dad went to the radio in his office. He turned on several other stations. Came back to his son and said, son, this is just a radio play of some sort. The Martians are not attacking. There is no other news source reporting Martian attacks. You can relax. And what that father did in that moment is exactly what we kind of have to do with fake news. Approach it analytically. First of all, have a healthy amount of skepticism. Don't believe it the first time you hear it. No matter how much you want to, no matter how much it fits with what you believe might be real, be a little skeptical. Be sure it's real. Ask, who is it that's telling this to you? Do they have an ax to grind? Do they have a political agenda? Are they going to make a profit from it? Are they a reliable source? And then, is it verifiable? Are other reliable sources reporting this? Is, uh, is there facts and evidence that they're using to back it up? So, that's all we can do in this modern age is just try to... Um, Take a moment, take a breath, look at the situation, and be analytical about what you hear. And so you know that this whole lecture isn't fake news. There's some of my sources. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, to wrap things up, I've got a couple of expert panelists to come help me out, and we'll answer a few questions. So I believe, uh, let's see, Gerald Burnett, uh, he is our government and history instructor here, as well as an adjunct professor at TJC. He'll be one of our other experts in history. And then uh, Deacon Bill Necessary, if we're going to talk about sci-fi, he is the man to be our uh, expert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll take a few questions. Yeah, Gerald, right, so anyone have any questions about the uh, broadcast? All right. Uh, here, just a comment. One more thing we could do together as a society is not forward something you have not actually checked the facts on yourself. Yes. That'll stop viral spread of things that are false. Yeah, that is a big part of the being responsible. Be sure what you're forwarding is indeed the truth. And that, that's a really good point. All right. Any questions about any of this? All right, well, let's start it out then. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of the sci-fi. What, what can you tell us about the period when this uh, occurs. 1938, um, the pulp magazine was very popular. Amazing stories, astounding science fiction stories. That gave, to, that gave the, the start to some authors who we, who we would uh, learn later to be Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov. Uh, in motion pictures, sci-fi films weren't all that big. Um, there were a few sci-fi films like the things to come. King Kong was considered a sci-fi epic, an early sci-fi epic in 1933. Frankenstein, the first Frankenstein film in 31, was considered a sci-fi epic. But <clears throat> sci-fi was considered mostly kitty fare that you would see in the movie serials like uh, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. And aside from the pulps and uh, a few novels, the newspaper comic strip was popular with Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and so forth. And then in 1935, a new medium had started, the comic book. And uh, many newspapers uh, strips were reprinted. And then finally, in 1938, just, just a few months prior to this broadcast, um, two high school kids from Cleveland, Ohio, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, invented uh, a, a new character called Superman. 
and <laughs> Superman was the first superhero, and and when he started, uh, when well, the Superman strip started, then comic books began to sell by the carload. So basically, your sci-fi was was comics, radio, and uh, the pulps, and the serials. And that was it. And I believe in your mission. We were talking about this earlier. You had mentioned that Superman was also considered one of those invaders from another planet. To a it was planet. it was re it was reversed because Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers went to other planets to fight evil. Superman was an alien from the planet Krypton who came to Earth and 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 fought evil. So it's kind of a reverse of Flash Gordon. So that made that character a little unique. I was as I was listening to your presentation. Lonnie, I was, I was remembering that uh, I, I'm a bit of a, a World War One historian, and this also connects to an to an earlier, uh, an earlier genre of uh, of invasion literature. Uh, there's a whole genre of invasion literature that grew up in the late 1890s to about through the beginning of World War One. Uh, that was that was these were not these were novels that were serialized in newspapers. So you would read this invasion story that was going on in the newspaper. Matter of fact, The War of the Worlds was actually pub published in 1898 as a serialized invasion novel. Uh, and, and there was a whole series of those. Uh, uh, there's an Erskine Childers uh, book, The Riddle of the Sands, in, in, uh, in right about 1912. Uh, uh, John Buchan's book, uh, The 39 Steps, in 1914. And, and these were all uh, uh, set with the Germans invading, invading Britain, uh, and s so you have this this whole fear factor that's already built in to an invasion scenario, and that's that's, that's playing in this as well. And, and fear is a big part of it. With with all this fake news, a lot of time it plays on our fears, our anxieties, and that we're very susceptible to believing uh, fake news during those times. <coughs> right. Okay. I think it's important to note also that some of the earliest science fiction novels like H.G. Wells and Jules Verne were also coming from a time of empiricism, positivism, and so even in the clip of the radio story that you gave, it's like reinforcing this um, kind of empirical data and significance signification of the report, um, so we can then remember when we do encounter multiple sources, it's important to look where they are coming from and to make sure that what they are saying, you know, is a true representation as well and kind of do it, like remember uh, that like Jules Byrne and H.G. Wells are a little bit different also today than like some of these characters that are coming out at the end of the 1930s, it seems, as well. Yeah, right, it, it's part of the you know, kind of context, you know, you're listening to a radio play from this author, produced by somebody else in a different time period, so you have several layers of context that are, you know, kind of shaping the way it's going to be perceived. Do y'all have any comments? Right. Any other questions? Okay. Um, recently, there was, um, well, what happened was is a, a, a Russian source created um, two fake Facebook pages. Uh, one was a, a Facebook page about um, uh, like Muslim pride and, you know, and things like that. And the other one was uh, something about Texas pride. And they created these pages to get people to follow them in the United States to incite division and violence and things like that. And uh, when Facebook and uh, people found out about it and they shut them down or whatever, they had to go to Capitol Hill to explain why they hadn't found out earlier that this was going on. And so I guess my question is, is when things like that happen and we deal in a, we live in a country that believes in freedom of the press and freedom of speech, I mean, how do we deal with things like that? You know, should there be more regulation on social media? You know, how do we... How do we combat that kind of stuff from happening? Because obviously, you know, especially in the wake of things that have happened recently, it's, it's violence, things that happen. I mean, we can't blame it all on social media, but surely with the uh, social media just out there and everything, it's just so easy to, to incite violence, you know, through ideas and things like that. So. 
that's a very good point with, um, th that is a <laughs> double-edged sword that is freedom of the press in a free society. <coughs> People have the right to post things, to have their own internet pages, the news can print things. And if you try to catch everything that's fake, <coughs> You, you may be take, is treading on people's rights. At the same time, if you start clamping down, then you've got the problem of, are we restricting information? Are we creating a situation where it's easier for a government to then control the media and uh, present just their mm -hmm. point of view? And so it's a very difficult balance. So, the, rea the reality is, is that, that throughout history, most fake news has actually come from governments where you create whole propaganda machines that are there to, to, you know, to create stories, to slant stories, uh, to frame stories in order to convince you that you know, the Germans are evil or you know, the British are evil or whatever, or, or whatever it is. And uh, if, you, if you take the view that, uh, yeah, we're, the government needs to regulate this, hey, they will. You know, and then the government will tell you what's evil and what's not. And so I think you, you have to you have to have that free exchange of, of information and we have to do what Lonnie was saying. We have to filter it ourselves and and, and look at it through a lens of uh, does this make sense? Does this really make sense to me? You know, or maybe I just need to be questioning this a little bit more or I'm talking to some people. Does this you know, I I know some of these people. Does are they really evil? You know, that kind of thing. And you have to really kind of look at Put your rational hat on a little bit. All right, time for one more question. All right. Does our uh, panel of historians uh, know or feel that in this specific instance, the War of the Worlds uh, or production, was there a specific uh, agenda or statement that was being pushed or put out by these writers and producers? Well, as he says at the end, he's kind of making the point that. This little device is the inhabitant of the pumpkin patch. You can't quite trust it. So to a certain degree, maybe if you take him at his word, one of his points might be that uh, you need to kind of be careful with the media that you're listening to. Uh, what else? You, you know, he, he did there are two, very th two things in here which, which you play that, that were very subtle little twists on that, on that night, like mm -hmm. uh, the Secretary of the Interior who sounded an awful lot like FDR. <laughs> And, and Carl Phillips sounded an awful lot like the journalist at the Hindenburg disaster. He was trying to, uh, in a way, inject a little bit of, of, of perhaps reality into his, in, into his fiction, um, trying to get people to, 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 to believe that this is more than just a little joke. I mean, it, it's a, it was a commentary, I thought, on, on, uh, on the culture at the time, but you know, let's just see how, how much we can get people to believe this a little bit. And there was a little bit of that, I think. Um, he did not plan to do that little, that little um, post broadcast. This, this is just a Halloween prank thing. He was forced to do that. He, he didn't want to do that. They made it. But he knew what he was doing. I think. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. We'll be around if you have any more questions. And you all have a blessed evening.